Welcome to Northside Community Church. Uh, if you're newer here, we are glad that you have joined us. Um, and we're just thankful for the technology that we have even to do this. Uh, the only announcement I think I have is that our AGM is in two weeks, uh, Sunday evening, March 7th. Uh, a pretty significant meeting is we will be uh, presenting revised bylaws. Uh, we've been reworking those, simplifying those, and so that will be presented. Uh, so that's a, a pretty significant thing for us, the financials from last year, et cetera. So uh, we hope if you remember that you're able to join us. Uh, before I open the word, let me just pray uh, one more time and ask the, the preacher to speak to us. Father God, we come to you and we are uh, grateful for um our conditions um that sounds weird in some ways means that we are in a pandemic but we know that you are a great god that you're in control that you are accomplishing your purposes your will and in doing it in your way and we want to be a part of that so you know how can we join you in this adventure and, and we pray that you will work in us that you'll work through us uh, thank you for Mackie and for leading us in those songs. Thank you for Hannah and just her simple faith and trust in you. There's being on a team without friends or whatever it is that, and an anxiety that uh, you are a testimony, that you are speaking to her. May we all learn from that. I pray that as we open your word this morning that Jesus, you would be uh, the preacher, the Holy Spirit, you would guide us into your truth. And Father, thank you for your love and your um, pursuit of us. So, yeah, thank you for where we live, for, for the security that we enjoy. Um, even just what comes to mind is what's going on in parts of the states with the cold and no power and no water. And we are blessed to be where we are and to have the provisions that we have. So we thank you. Uh, we don't take any of that for granted and we give you thanks and praise today. So yeah, lead us now as we open your word. I pray in Jesus name, amen. <clears throat> well, last week, Ryan was talking about uh, pursuing a hippie named Sarah at Creation Fest. And uh, I, that really resonated with me. Uh, I, it makes me it takes me back to when I went to Prairie and I, I I met this young woman there named Tammy. But how that came about is really rather unique as well. Uh, when I went to Prairie, I didn't really want to be there, and I had a few issues. And I remember there was a guy that lived across the hall. His name was Martin, and his his roommate was. Marvin, who was Tammy's brother. And I would go in and I would talk to Martin and sort of vent to him. And I'm, I'm in his room one day and I'm venting and I see this picture on Marvin's desk of this, of this girl. I said, who's that? Is that his girlfriend? He said, no, that's his sister. I said, oh, okay. And Martin said, yeah, she's here this year. I said, really, is she like a junior or a senior? And I was a freshman. And he said, no, she's a freshman. I went, oh, a freshman. I'll have to keep my eyes open for this, for this beauty. So I did. I started to, to, to look in my classes to see where, where is this girl sitting? Uh, and, you know, where does she sit during chapel? And where does she sit in the dining room? And, I'm, and for me, honestly, there's a fine line probably bet between pursuing and stalking. And uh, maybe more... I might have been more stalking than pursuing, but anyway. At, at Prairie, there was, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there were a lot of rules back then. I was thinking this week about now with cell phones, like they couldn't even enforce those rules anymore. But, you know, a guy sat on one side of the classroom, girls sat on the other, same in the dining room, same in, the, in chapel. So you had these divisions. So in order to get to know somebody, you, you, you kind of have to manipulate the system a little bit. And I remember the one day when, 
you came off the, the dining room lines, the guys had their line, the girls had their line, but at lunch, they had what they called mixed seating so that people would learn how to socialize a little bit. And I was seated with, at the table with Tammy. And I started telling her stuff about her that, and she didn't even know who I was. I'm going, oh, you're, you're Marvin's sister. And she's going like, okay, this guy's a little creepy. Uh, I said, yeah, I said, I, I live across the hall from Marvin and yada, yada, yada. Anyway, um, all of that to say that I, I was pursuing her. And I, and I think when we talk about pursuing Jesus in communities, you know, I, that word pursuing is, is a bit of a challenge for people. But so I want you to think about it in the idea of pursuing relationship. I looked up a definition of pursue this week, and it was uh, one of the de definitions is to to chase after, to overtake and to kill, which is not the pursuing that we want to have here in our church. We want the pursuing of relationship um, that we are seeking after somebody, going, wanting to know somebody. And that's what it was with, with Tammy and I. All I wanted to do, I wanted to be near her. I wanted to be in her presence. I wanted to talk to her. Um, and so, you know, that's when we talk about pursuing Jesus, that's, that's really what we're talking about. We just want to be in his presence. Do you want to be in Jesus' presence? We're not pursuing a what. We are pursuing a someone, uh, a, a, a who, Jesus. You know, the previous little vision clip that we used to have said pursuing uh, the heart of Jesus in our community. And we, as you know, we have pared that down to pursuing Jesus in community. And one of the reasons that we took out in the heart, pursuing the heart of Jesus, is because that can be taken to mean in the spirit of, in, in, in the style of, or whatever. And we don't want to pursue the spirit of Jesus, or we don't want to do something in the spirit. We want Jesus himself. We want the person. And so we, we just want to pursue Jesus. You know, when it comes to um, pursuing Jesus, it's not about what you know. Sometimes it's the newest believer who has the greatest pursuit of Jesus. It's not about downloading information. It's not about being able to uh, spew out all kinds of information. And I have met people who, who think that that's the case. I remember an elder at a previous church who was very scholarly. And his idea of evangelism was that if you had a good apologetic, if you had a good argument, then the person would turn come to faith in Christ. And that's just not the case. It isn't, you, you don't win arguments and have people come to faith in Christ. Um, they have to meet Jesus for who he is. You know, there are, there are academics, there are scholars who will go to hell. They can, they can argue way more about the Hebrew and the Greek than you and I can, uh, but some of them may go to hell because they don't actually know the person of Jesus. And it's not about changing our behavior, although, you know, these are byproducts as we learn about Jesus as, you know, it will transform our lives. But it's not like, well, I changed my life and now I'm okay that Jesus, you know, I qualify, so to speak. Uh, John 5, 39, Jesus talking to the Pharisees who were all about behavior modification, information download. They would have memorized probably the first five books of the Bible. And they had rules about rules about rules. Jesus said to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. That in knowledge you have eternal life. And it is they, the scriptures, that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So life is actually in, is in the person of Jesus. It's not in how much you know. It's not in how good you are. It's this pursuit of Jesus, this person. So we want to talk a little bit more about that today, pursuing Jesus. Uh, some scriptures that I want us to, to sort of focus on to help us understand this word that we're not going to overtake and kill something. Uh, 
you know, Psalm 42, we sang this song last week. It says, as, as a deer pants for the flowing stream, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. That's the kind of pursuing that we're talking about. That it is like, you know, if you're in a desert and you get that, that water and it just refreshes your soul. That's what your relationship with Jesus needs to be like. Psalm 63, 1, again, another verse about being in a wilderness area. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. So pants, oh, um, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David wrote that when he was in the wilderness fleeing from Saul. And he was actually at the... Uh, at En Gedi, which is a, a, a spring in the wilderness. And it's, there's this beautiful little spring that's there and this, there's plants and there's animals. Uh, and that's what David is likening his relationship with God with. His flesh fainting for God. Uh, David is described as a man after God's heart who will do his will in, in uh, 1 Samuel, also in Acts 13. I think uh, Tim referenced this verse a few weeks ago. Psalm 27. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That needs to be the passion of our hearts, is to pursue Jesus, the person. And, and just to spend time in his presence. You know, not just on Sundays, but in the everyday stuff of life. We were talking about this in our community group this week. You know, it's not just like when we gathered this morning as we are, that we think about Jesus and we focus on him. It's in the everyday stuff of life. Jeff van der Stelt describes discipleship in this way. Discipleship is the ongoing process of submitting all of life to Jesus. And seeing him saturate our entire life and world with his presence and power. It's a process of daily growing in your awareness of your need for him in the everyday stuff of life. It is walking with Jesus, being filled with Jesus, and being led by Jesus in every place and in every way. Does that describe your pursuit of Jesus? Whether you are at work, whether you are at play, whether you're driving in the car, whether you're with your spouse or with your children, when you're at the grocery store waiting in that line, to be saturated with the presence and power of Jesus in the everyday stuff of life. I want you to think with me about some of the implications of this. Think, think about your life and all the things that you, will, that you did yesterday, maybe the things you did that you will do today, and the fact of having Jesus' presence and power uh, saturating your life. The Apostle Paul's theology is all centered on being in Christ. He says in Philippians 1, For me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. In chapter 3, he says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. There's nothing greater in your life than pursuing Jesus. In 2 Corinthians, he says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. In Colossians, he talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. So just the idea that Christ is in you. In John 15, there's a, this whole chapter about being in the vine. Abide in me, he says, the vine, and I in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. E. Stanley Jones says this. The business of my life and the only business of my life is to abide in him. All else will follow. Our whole pursuit is to be of Jesus. That's it. Everything else will fall into line. And I want us to think about this for a moment. I mean, uh, fairly recently, uh, a, a prominent Christian leader um, who has since has passed away as well, 
but it has come to light that this person that there was uh, sexual stuff going on in his life that it was inappropriate and this is somebody that people looked up to prominent and because of his prominence probably nobody was holding him to account and and really when it comes down to this you know where is where was the abiding in the vine in his life very knowledgeable and yet there was this other side and you know, honestly i'm not, i'm i don't want to be too critical because we are all, to me, I, we are all this far away from being there. We all have that, you know, the old nature, we are a new creation, but we still live in this body of flesh. The sin principle lives in us, and none of us are very far away from great, great sin. And we all have sin. So we, it is so important for us to nurture that relationship with Jesus. Um, for those of you who are wondering, uh, I'm referring to the Rabbi Zacharias, but there's been a number of Christian leaders over the years who have uh, fallen out of, fallen from grace, so to speak. And so, you know, these great people that we looked up to, you know, you, putting people on a pedestal is a dangerous thing. Uh, and we all need to be pursuing Jesus and nurturing that his presence in our lives and and all of that a quote that i came across this week being in him means we are in everything that is in him being in him we are in everything good everything joyous everything creative everything healthy everything for time and eternity being in jesus means being in his love in his light his life his holiness his wisdom his power his peace his hope and on it goes. Being in Jesus means we are in those things. But it isn't just that we are in Jesus. Jesus is in us. And so with Jesus being in us, all those things that I've just mentioned are, are already in us. His love, his light, his life, his holiness, his power, etc. So we are in Jesus Jesus is in us, but who, where is Jesus? Jesus is in, uh, in his life, is in relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus lives in the inner life of the triune God, and that is what we're invited into. That's the, for, I think for me, one of the most powerful things about this vision statement that we have, pursuing Jesus in community. Our triune God is community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, complete in that, and he has invited us into that. We're going to talk more about that in, in the weeks to come. In a couple of weeks, Tim is going to be speaking, and he'll be talking about the fact that we're invited into this community with God. The creator of the universe has invited us to be in relationship with him, and he has placed uh, the spirit of his son in us, and we are in him, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Imagine mere human beings, sinful human beings at that, invited to live in the inner life of the living God. So to pursue Jesus is to live in Jesus, to be in his presence. It is also, though, to live in his gospel. And I, I was thinking how at times in the past, I would have described this as living out his gospel. But that makes it something that we do. It's not something, you know, and that makes it maybe, uh, again, works. This is living in his gospel, allowing the truth of the gospel to permeate our lives. Uh, So what does that mean? I'm going to read uh, something I read this week again. Um, the question we to keep asking ourselves is, what is the gospel? Take out a piece of paper and write out what you believe the gospel to be. Ask, what is finished on the cross? What has been done 
that never needs to be repeated and needs nothing added to it. Ask, what is the nature of the victory God won in the death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth? Ask, what changes resulted in and for the universe because of what God did on the cross and in the empty tomb? Ask, what does it mean that Jesus is now at the right hand of the Father? Ask, so what does it mean that Jesus has poured out the Holy Spirit upon us? Ask, is there anything or anyone who can undo what Jesus has done? Ask, what are the consequences for the world knowing that Jesus is Lord? Ask, what does that new creation, which is soon to descend to the earth, look like? Sin has been overcome. Evil has been overcome. Death has been overcome. The door into the presence of the holy God has been opened wide. The principalities and powers have been put in their place. The kingdom of God is breaking into the kingdom, kingdoms of darkness and death. The chains of oppression are being cut. The way the universe goes together has been forever altered and altered in the direction of setting captives free. Think about the implications of the truth of the gospel in your life and live in the gospel. Live in the presence of Jesus. Live in the implications of the gospel. Thirdly, live in his word. So when I was dating Tammy and we were at Prairie, there were certain limitations. We could only see each other a certain amount uh, and uh, honestly, not really until our third and fourth years. So what did we do? We wrote letters. You know, I remember telling her, you know, to lower your expectations, uh, Tam, because, you know, I'm, you know, don't, don't put expectations on me. But then reality is, when we were home in the summer, I was writing her every day. I was phoning her at least once a week because I just wanted to hear from her. I wanted to communicate with her. And God has written us a letter. It's called the Bible. And we need to be students of the scriptures. I came across a story this week of, of, a cup, uh, of a couple who lived in a house in Nova Scotia. And they had lived in this house for 25 years. And then they, they were doing some renovation. And this, they were tearing off uh, some of the wall, tearing into the walls. They found things inside the walls. They found postcards and, and other things. And these postcards had been there for... 50 some years and they recognized the name on the postcard and they were able to take these postcards and return them to the person who had written them and, and it was a woman who um, named Mary Fredericks who when she was 17 went with her father and brothers from Nova Scotia to Newfoundland and in Newfoundland she met this this young man whom she was quite taken with so when she returned home, she started writing, she sent these postcards to him, which, and, and she was dating a guy at the time. She broke up with a guy and ended up marrying this other guy to whom she sent the postcards. And then 50 some years later, these postcards were found and returned to her and her husband, who had, at that point had been married for 57 years. So in the absence of, of the physical presence, they were, they, she had written postcards. The same way that I would write Tammy letters because I couldn't be in her physical presence. And God has written us a love letter in his, in his word. And the subject of that letter is his redemptive plan that he is still accomplishing through Jesus. So we need to be students of his word, of his letter. Psalm 1 tells us, you know, not to walk in the counsel of the wicked and what it looks like to be nourished by his word. Psalm 19 talks about the, the benefits of, of his word and how good that is for us. Psalm 119, particularly verse 11, tells us that if we abide in the word, it will keep us from sin. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is profitable. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, in order that we might be competent, equipped for every good work. 
So we need to spend time in his presence. Uh, and I would suggest that we can do that through, we need to take time to have silence. We need to take time in solitude. We need to take time in Sabbath in his presence. We need to be um, in him and he needs to be in us. We need to live in his gospel and we need to live in his word. We need to re read the letter that was written to us. Reread the letter. Pour over the letter. Meditate on it. Ruminate in it. How much time do we waste listening to words that do not matter? And God is calling us over and over to study, to read, to meditate, to memorize, to listen to, and respond in obedience to his word, to be a student of the scriptures. In addition to his word to us, there are many other books that are written that we can read. Are you a reader? I know some of you are readers, but what are you reading? We have a church library full of what I, okay, and I'm going to, I'm going to sacrifice a sacred cow here. Sorry, people. Um, but they're like Christian Harlequin romance books, these series that are in our church library. And I know many of you read those those books, those novels, those, those fictional things where everybody comes to Jesus and lives happily ever after. Um, they are a nice escape maybe, but are they reality? When was the last time you read a book about spiritual practices? When was the last time you read a book just to nourish your soul? Um, when was the last time you read a non-fictional biography of some remarkable Christian that is rather than reading some fictional novel. When I, when I read, I usually try to have three books on the go at a time. One book will be, I try to read a biography uh, of someone. I try to read a book that equips me for ministry right now. It, it is, I'm reading The Glory of Preaching by Daryl Johnson, which has been quite an influence on me. And then I also read a book just to nourish my soul and uh, understand who I am, why I do the things I do. Uh, the other elders are reading it as well. Uh, so a biography, something to equip me and something to feed my soul. What are you reading? Are you living in other books that strengthen your relationship with Jesus? We also need to live in our culture. Karl Barth is known for having said, we live with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Now, if you're younger, maybe you don't even know what a newspaper is, but they still make them. Uh, you probably get your news on the TV or on your cell phone, um, but newspapers are really, they're, they're made out of paper. And that's why they're called newspaper and they were filled with news and editorials and articles. Um, but they inform us as to our times. And we, are, we live in a culture and our culture has changed dramatically since I was a kid. It continues to change. And we, need, we are in the world. We are not to be of the world. But we need to be aware of the culture around us so that the gospel that we have is relevant to the people with whom we live our lives. Romans 12 says, do not let the world, this is J.B. Phillips uh, translation, do not let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. Right? We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. But how else can you relate the truth of the gospel if, if your head is in the sand, if you are completely isolated from those around you and you have no idea what they're going through? but we are not to live in the culture at the expense of living in Jesus' kingdom. I like in, in First Chronicles, there was the people of Issachar were known for, the, for being people who under, had understanding of the times and knew what God's people ought to do. That should describe us. We should be people who understand our times and know what God's people ought to do. And that's part of this whole visioning process. We want to discern together. As elders, we don't have 
you know, a five-year plan that we're going to lay out for you and say, here, this is what we're going to do. You know, this is going to bubble up from all of us. You know, God has e equipped each one of us and all of us to do something together. And we want to discern that in the days to come. Who are the people that God has brought to this church? And why has he given us the gifts of these people and their abilities that he has given us? What are the needs in our community that these gifts are uniquely designed to meet? That is the process that we are in, is to figure this stuff out. So we need to live in the presence of, of Jesus. We need to live in his word. We need to live in other books. We need to live in our culture. We also need to live in his suffering, in Jesus' suffering. Jesus says to his disciples just before he was crucified, he says, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. In other words, in the same way that Jesus entered into the suffering of this world, he is sending us to enter into the suffering of this world in order to bring his wholeness and healing. Jesus entered into suffering to bring forgiveness of sins, to bring wholeness, to bring healing. And we are sent into this world in the same way, to bring his, his gospel of wholeness and healing to the world around us. We are his representatives. He has placed his spirit within us for that purpose. You know, if you read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, and it talks about having them that we need to have the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. And then it describes what he did, who, 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 though he was God, he did not consider that something to be grasped, but he took on human form and he suffered as a human and he suffered death and not just an ordinary death, death on a cross. He humbled himself and suffered for humanity. And that is the mind that we are to have in ourselves, to humble ourselves, to enter into uh, the suffering of this world, to bring reconciliation, which will result in glorification. At the end of that passage, it talks about, and because of that, he was exalted to the right hand of the Father. So we enter into this and identify with the suffering of this world. So we need to live in suffering. We need to live in prayer. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. And we need to pray for our needs. Philippians 4, rejoice always, be reasonable to everyone. The Lord is near to you. Be anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, and he will give you his peace. So, yes, pray for your needs. Have a life of prayer. And that prayer is not just sharing our needs it's also listening that's where that silence and that solitude and that sabbath come in also you know there's a thing called the daily examine where at the end of the day you just go when did i feel closest to god a pause at the end of the day there's another spiritual practice called the daily office where throughout the day you just stop and practice the presence of jesus in your life that's how you develop uh, a life of prayer is by stopping and taking a few moments to do that you also need to pray for others i've talked before about the lighthouses of prayer pray for the your neighbors on either side of you and for the three across the street from you and and pray for them uh, before you talk to people about god you need to talk to god about those people thank god for what he is doing in their lives because he is at work and pray for that work to continue in their life. And as you have opportunity to partner with him and, and speak into that, uh, he will give you opportunities. So you need to pray for your needs. You need to pray for others. And you need to pray with others. Pursuing Jesus in community. This is not, this is not a life that we live on our own. Pray with your spouse. Pray with your children. Pray with your community group. And as you have opportunity, as you come across people, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's in a store, um, ask others if they would like prayer. We were we were sharing with somebody, somebody that Tammy and I know at Superstore, she, she works there. 
Um, and we were sharing about our friend of ours who's going through uh, a difficult time. Uh, she knows about Tammy's cancer. She has, has gone through cancer and this friend of ours is going through cancer. And so we, as we were sharing, she says, what's this person's name? And this, so this person who doesn't know our friend is praying for our friend. That's what we need to be doing. We need to live in prayer. I remember it's uh, in my utmost for his highest and, and Pete Barrett used to say this all the time. We don't, you don't pray about the work. Prayer is the work. I can't say that enough. Prayer is the work. So live in prayer. And my final thing this morning is to live in anticipation. Live in expectancy, especially as you pray, as you are abiding in Christ. God, he, he is going to do things in your life. He is going to do things through your life. And you need to expect that. Keep your eyes open to see where he is at work. God desires to work in your life. God desires to work through your life. And we need to be partnering with God to see his kingdom come and his will being done on earth as, as it is in heaven. It is happening. And we need to pay attention to that. So that's maybe a lot of how to pursue Jesus. But I guess one of the other questions that we need to answer this morning and I'm honestly not going to take a lot of time doing it, but it is the why Jesus. Why pursue Jesus? Well, there's been nobody else in history who, who entered into time and space and altered humanity any more than Jesus has and continues to do. He is God in the flesh. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He is interceding for us according to the will of the Father. We have the Holy Spirit within us, interceding according to the will of the Father. And, and you know, nobody has done what he has done. I've spoken on this before. This book here, John Ortberg, Who is this man? The unpredictable impact of the inescapable Jesus that goes through and just talks about the impact that Jesus had on the world. He never even left Israel. He barely left Galilee other than to go down to festivals and, and, and uh, in, in Jerusalem. And yet he has altered history. Think about John 1, 1 through 5. Make a note. I, in the questions that will go out this afternoon, I will list these scriptures so you can spend some time reviewing these. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. Jesus is God and he became flesh. He became like us. Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 14 about who we are in Christ and who he is. Like incredible truths that are stated there. Colossians 1 verses 15 through 20. Who Jesus is. Firstborn from the dead. Uh, in him, he created all things, and in him, all things hold together. Think about that. The, the creator of the universe who holds everything together, who keeps you breathing and your heart beating, dwells within you. Uh, Hebrews 1, verses 3 through 4, talks about him being the exact representation of God. That he is, he has his divine nature within him, and he has been revealed to us at the right, just at the right time. And we can be, we are invited into that relationship with him. No one in history has done or continues to do what Jesus has done. That's the why. Because of who he is. Think of any other religious leader with whom you are familiar, be it a Buddha, be it a, a guru, be it um, a pastor, you know, and, and like I said, we've, we've seen pastors fall from grace. There's been no other like Jesus. No other name under heaven by which you can be saved. Just Jesus. So I'm going to close <clears throat> with a historic prayer. A prayer by St. Augustine. 
of Hippo, who lived in the fourth century AD. I'll close with this. Lord Jesus, let me know myself and know you and desire nothing save only you. Let me hate myself and love you. Let me do everything for the sake of you. Let me humble myself and exalt you. Let me think of nothing except you. Let me die to myself and live in you. Let me accept whatever happens as from you. Let me banish self and follow you and ever desire to follow you. Let me fly from myself and take refuge in you that I may deserve to be defended by you. Let me fear for myself. Let me fear you and let me be among those who are chosen by you. Let me distrust myself and put my trust in you. Let me be willing to obey for the sake of you. Let me cling to nothing save only you. <clears throat> and let me be poor because of you. Look upon me that I may love you. Call me that I may see you and forever enjoy you. Amen. And amen. We'll turn it over to Matthew. All right. Um, let's sing a few more songs.
voice is so heaven had lost. Birth and Jesus arose with our freedom in hands. That's when death was arrested and my life began.
I just wanted to read um, these verses over us before um, before we open up conversation or prayer time. Um, it's a bit lengthy, so I invite you to close your eyes and just listen. Uh, it's Romans 6, 1 to 14. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. For if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Amen.